beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. Isn't that a wonderful song? Amen. I love to read it. I love to think about it. But this week as I have prayed and sought the Lord and it was here last night praying. Boy, I tell you what, we had a wonderful time. Amen. Praying and seeking the Lord last night. I told Jen when we got home, I said I've been in a lot of church services that had 2,000 more people than what we had last night. Uh, we was down here praying and I have felt less with 2,000 in service than I did last night. I shouted right here around this altar last night. Felt the glory of the Lord. And, uh, and, and it doesn't take a whole lot. This is in prayer last night. And uh, over the past few days, I felt this verse come to me at different times through the week. And uh, as, I, as I felt it come to me, it didn't just come, it, it didn't just come pointed at me to where that, uh, you know, God just, just dumped it right on me, boy. It was just, it was just like a burning fire. But it seemed like he just kind of grazed me with it as he went by two or three times. Kind of grazed it at me. And then last night as I was praying, it came a little more pointed than that. And as I began to pray about it in the night last night and early this morning, I felt directed to preach to us this morning from that fifth verse. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So I want to preach to you this morning about dining with the devil. Amen. I don't want to pick the devil for a dinner day. Do you? He's not, I'm not interested in going out to eat with him. If you want to go out and eat with us today, we'll go somewhere. We'll sit down at a restaurant of some sort. And uh, more than likely, it'll be fish, pizza, or Mexican. And, uh, but we'll sit down somewhere and we'll eat something. I don't mind eating with you. I don't mind eating with other people. I, I go to a restaurant and see somebody I know. I don't mind if they come over and say something to me, visit with me. If I see someone I know, I'm going to speak to them. But the devil is not my choice for a dinner day. All right? And when I read the fifth verse here, Thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're not really supposed to have enemies. The Bible said like this, If a man's ways please the Lord, he, the Lord, will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. So we're not supposed to have enemies. There's some people that I like a little more than I like others. I'm not going to lie to you. And there's some people this morning that just flat don't like me. And it seems like I've come across some folks that have almost wanted to make a career out of letting everybody else know how little that they thought about me. I can't help that. I've tried to do things about it, tried to make things right with people. Some people are just so stinking rotten that you can't hardly get along with them. And so when I think about somebody to go to eat with, that person that is treated me bad, will never wave at me when they pass me, can't ever smile, can't ever have anything kind to say. They're not on my choice list for dinner dates. Amen. But I want you to know this morning the main enemy that you and I have. Chief enemy number one. Public enemy number one. It's not Al Capone. It's not, amen. It's not any of those. It's not Switchblade Sam. It's not, amen. It's not the 44 killer. Amen. The, the number one enemy of the soul of man this morning is the devil. Amen. We have an enemy. We know who he is. We know what his name is. We know what he's about. The Bible tells us he's a thief. The Bible also tells us he was a murderer from the beginning. Amen. The Bible tells us he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. He is my enemy this morning. Yep. How about you? Amen. Is he yours? The old song we sing, the devil's mad, not glad. Glory, hallelujah. He lost a soul that he thought, I don't want to ever get to the place that the devil wants to go eat Sunday dinner with me. David said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Right in the middle of the enemy. Did he, did he say that we would never encounter an enemy? No. He simply reiterated us here that even when I'm in the presence of an enemy, even though there's enemies around me, even though I'm facing things I don't understand, God's got a way of putting a table together right in the presence of my enemy, and I can eat and eat well. In the presence of my enemy. 
This table that David's talking about here, more than likely, is not actually a table like a dining room table. He is a shepherd. David is probably talking about more than likely in, in the western United States and in, uh, in many places in south, south parts of, of Europe, over there where, the, where there are shepherds are, are uh, more prevalent than they are here. Uh, my old ag teacher, Tom Holcomb, called sheep grass maggots. Amen. Said so that anything the world would tear up a place any worse than a sheep will. And as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather smell a hog than a wet sheep. If you ain't ever smelled sheep, you, you missed out. I'm telling you, they're a stinking creature. And sheep, uh, well, they're not dumb, but they are dependent at best. They are an animal that depends on a shepherd. Now, the reason I won't tell you they're dumb is because the Bible likens us to sheep all through the Scripture and it likens Christ to our shepherd. So I hate to tell you sheep are dumb and then go along and tell you that you are a sheep in God's pasture. But they are dependent animals and you are a dependent animal. The sheep depend on the shepherd. A sheep is a relatively defenseless animal. He don't, he don't have a shell like the armadillo does. He don't have a stinger like a scorpion or fangs like a snake. He don't have horns like a deer to defend itself. A sheep is relatively defenseless. According to everything I can understand, I've got a book at home and I read some of it this morning. It's been several years since I picked it up. A man named Philip Keller wrote it. And it's, the name of the book is A Shepherd Looks at Psalms 23. Philip Keller said in his book, he is a shepherd. And he dissects the 23rd Psalm. Philip Keller said like this, he said, Most of the time when a bear, a lion, a cougar, a wolf, whatever, stampede a herd of sheep, most of the time when a, when, a, when a predator comes in among the sheep, he said sheep rarely utter any sound while being attacked. He said the only way that a shepherd usually knows that the sheep are under attack is when he hears a sound from the predator or the sound of a stampede. He said most of the time sheep are struck dumb when they become afraid. They don't bleat. They don't make a sound. He said most of the time their blood is spilled without ever uttering a sound to alert the shepherd that they're in trouble. I'm going to tell you this morning, if we're a sheep and we're in God's pasture and He is the chief, I'm the shepherd here over this little flock, but the chief shepherd is Christ. I'm just an under-shepherd to the chief shepherd. I want to tell you this morning, most of us as sheep in God's pasture are taken by the devil without ever making a sound. We don't want anybody to know we're in trouble. We don't want to work the shepherd. We don't want to cause a stampede in the flock. And so we just stand there and hope for the best while we're mauled to death by an enemy. That's exactly what a sheep does. The shepherd goes in in the late winter time while the snow's still on the ground. He understands that winter graze is about over. He's fixing to take them sheep out of the fold and take them up into the high pasture for the summer. And so, the western United States and there in Europe where the sheep are prevalent, they look for a plateau or a mesa. It comes from a Spanish word, mesa. Also, the African word for table is mesa. Many, many different countries use that same word. They look for those bases. This is probably the most common you read about it. When you get home, you look it up. It's called Table Mountain in Cape Town, Africa. It's one of the most widely visited, one of the most heavily visited national parks in Africa. It's one of the great wonders that men go to see in the world. Something like four to five million people go to visit Table Mountain every year. It's a place where the shepherds take sheep up those high cliffs. And when they get up on the high place, it is like a big mountain like this has been sawed off on the top and it's flat up there. It's a table. That's what they're looking for, for the sheep to graze. Now listen to me. I'm going to talk to you about this this morning. I'm going to try to break this down to your life, okay? The table, being the land, is prepared in the presence of enemies. The shepherd goes up there in the winter time and he begins to look the ground over. The snow's still there. He takes with him stores of salt and mineral and stores them in those places. That way when the springtime comes, summer begins to come on and the grass down low begins to go away, he starts taking those sheep up into those high table lands. It's called table land. You remember that song that said, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground? 
And it said on the table land, that's what it's talking about, that flat place there. The shepherd goes in and begins to prepare that long before the sheep ever are brought out of the fold with their lambs. Those ewes are there in the fold. It's the lambing season. They're calving out. I don't know what's calling the sheep, but calving's calving out. Anyway, they're down there having their babies and they're taking care of business. And then the shepherd takes them and he leads them up to the table that he's prepared. There's no way to get up those steep cliffs with a truck. There's no way to take things up by wagon. Those sheep, the shepherd said, without being aggressively hungry, will not ascend to that place. They just stay down here. They get hungry enough, and the winter's bad enough, when that shepherd takes them out, and he begins to climb those rocks ahead of them. I want you to get a hold of this this morning. I won't try to preach in a way you can get a hold of it, okay? But as that shepherd begins to climb that cliff, he's not driving those sheep up it. He's leading them. He leadeth me in the side still waters. He's leading me through that valley. He's preparing a table there in the presence of my enemy. That shepherd goes in there in the late winter, the early spring. When the, when the snow thaws, that shepherd goes up into that table country. And he begins to look the ground over. Different types of weeds that are native to the area that the shepherd comes in. He pulls those weeds by hand. He'll have a spray rig. I had brother Coin Davis to spray for me this year. And, and uh, he brought a sprayer in, mixed this chemical up, began to spray, put the tractor in four wheel drive, start spraying the weeds and kill it all. But that's not the way it is with a shepherd. He goes in by hand, on his hands and his knees, and he crawled. And he looks and he inspects. He walks a million miles, stooped over, looking at the grass as it's coming out. And he spends time preparing that table. He spends time looking over. And he pulls out the noxious weeds by hand. Poisonous things that will harm those sheep. He prepares it ahead of time. He puts a salt lick out. He puts a mineral deposit out. He sections off a place for nighttime grazing. He sections off a bed ground for his sheep there. He's preparing it before the sheep ever get there. Now, he prepares the water the same way. He goes in, he cleans out water holes. He moves brush. He moves things around the water hole. I feel like I, I really feel like I got most of y'all's attention this morning. I think you're listening to me, so I want, I want you to stay in that mode right there. I want you to get some of this. That shepherd goes in. If there's a brush pile next to a water hole, he moves that. Because he knows a predator can lay up in that brush. And when the sheep come in and put their nose down and go to drinking, that predator will grab one out of that brush pile. He prepares all that before they get there. Takes care of all of that. He tastes the water. He tests the water. He makes sure it's good enough for them to drink. He tests. Now listen. He plucks the grasses. And he tests them with his own tongue to make sure they're sweet enough for those sheep. There's nothing bad here. He's tasting the grass and he's testing the water. Then that shepherd on his last journey in, the last thing he does before he brings his sheep up, he looks for predators. He scouts for sign. He looks around the water holes that he's prepared. He looks around the salt beds that he's made. He looks around the mineral deposits that he's made. He looks for wolf tracks. For cat tracks, for bear tracks, he starts looking. And he spends a few days there trapping out all the predator that he can. But the shepherd said not only are those high mountain meadows made for sheep, that's also where the predators live. They live up there. And he said around those plateaus and around those mesas, those tables as they call them, around those tables are high rib rock where the, where the cougars live and the bears live and the wolves live. And he said, even though I prepared this place for my sheep, I know they're going to eat there, but they're going to eat in the presence of the enemy. The cougar's going to lay on the ledge and watch them. The bear's going to stand there and he's going to watch them. The old coyote's going to sit on his haunches and he's going to watch them. But he's prepared a table there in the presence of the enemy. Praise God. They're not, I know there, 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 there seems to be a thrust in modern church ages. It seems like people want to discredit the devil. They want to laugh him down. I almost sometimes feel bad when I have a kid's crusade or a youth camp. When they dress up like a demon and make the devil look so bad and scary. And they put a black cape on him and little beady eyes. And they try to make him listen. I'm telling you, that ain't how the devil is this morning. 
the Bible said he makes himself appear as an angel of light. Amen. The devil disguises himself. He don't come in the middle of the sheep and let out a howl or a roar and say, I'm here to kill you. He sneaks in among them. He lays down and waits on them. I may have to dine with the devil. But brother, I'm telling you, God has been my shepherd. He climbed the cliff ahead of me. He checked the water hole out. He checked the feet out. And then David said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Did he, did he do it? Did he take care of it for us? Those sheep trust their shepherd. There's no thought in the sheep's mind. When I get there, he'll let me graze in a field of poison weeds. There's no thought in the sheep's mind. He's going to take us in to graze in the wolf's den. No. They trust and they depend on the shepherd. You know why? I can't even pronounce the name of the weed that is native to that, to that uh, table mountain area there. I can't even pronounce the name of it. But he said if there's one thing that those sheep will hit a field and go for, it is that weed. And it's something that poisons them. It kills them. And then Philip Keller in his book, he said those sheep, no matter how, and no matter how good the grass is, he said, if you left some weeds over there that are poison, the sheep are going to find them. Isn't that the way it is with us this morning? We know better than what we're doing. We know better than what we're involved in. But we have to taste the weed. And then God's got a field of green clover and a field of sweet grass for us. And that's how you and I respond so many times. We'll go in and start nibbling on the weeds. That's why He will ahead of us and said he was tempted at all points like as we are and yet without sin he was made sin for us that knew no sin I'm telling you he tasted the water he tasted the grass he knows what I'm facing he knows what you're facing amen the shepherd of my soul has prepared the table right in the presence of the enemy Help me, Lord, to preach this morning. Amen. He came down from glory. He tasted. The Bible said he tasted death for every man. He was made flesh for us. God. Amen. God was manifested in the flesh. He was tempted like we are. You say, I don't think anybody's ever been where I've been. I'm afraid probably nobody's ever went through what I'm going through. I just don't know if anybody can understand, so I'm not going to say anything. Nobody, people just make fun of me if I give in a prayer request. Nobody's going to really understand it. Nobody really knows what I'm going through. I tell you, somebody does. The shepherd does. Yeah. He's had his nose in your water hole. Long before that sheep, long before those little lambs ever climbed that rocky cliff to get up to the table land, the shepherd's already laid down and tasted in the water. He's already laid down and tasted the grass. Amen, brother. I want you to know he walks your road. He's a man of sorrow. He is acquainted with grief. He understands sorrow. He understands grief better than any man. He understands sickness. He understands pain. He understands sin. He understands temptation. Amen. He inhabits eternity. He's as far in yesterday as he is in tomorrow. And then God's not just a God of now. He's not just a God of yesterday. He's a God that's already went ahead of us and prepared the table in the presence of the enemy. Amen. You see, I don't know about walking up this cliff. I don't know about climbing that mountain. I don't know about those rocks up there. I'm not sure about that water hole. I'm not sure about this field I'm fixing to eat in. I want you to hear me this morning. The shepherd's been there long before you ever got there. Long before there was a hoof track of a single lamb, the shepherd had already been there. Long before you ever had endured a temptation. You just don't understand the temptation I'm dealing with. You just don't understand what I'm having to go through. You just don't understand how the devil's working on me. And I'm going to take you right back to the book every time and tell you he was tempted like you are. Yes. And yet without sin. Yes. And then, brother, the shepherd has oh. made it possible that I can live a holy life in another holy world. The Nothing shepherd Jesus. made it possible I could differentiate 
between grass and weeds. The shepherd cut my water hole. The shepherd put out my mineral. The shepherd put out my salt. He prepared my table in the presence of the enemy. Don't ever get to the place that you second guess the shepherd. When he walks out in the middle of the field, sticks his staff in the ground, and bids you to eat. Don't step back and say, uh-uh, I ain't eating that. I don't trust you. I'm going to go over here in this field. I'm going to go around behind this rock over here. I don't like to eat in front of everybody. So I'm going to go around behind this rock over here. I'll tell you what you'll do. You get to nosing around trying to do it on your own. You're going to be laying down with a belly ache and a tummy full of poison weed if you ain't careful. The shepherd knows where you need to eat. And if he points you down a path and then starts walking that path ahead of you with his staff in his hand, don't you sit there and dig your hooks in the ground. You take right off behind him. He's going to get you to the table before us in the presence of the enemy. Don't walk up to a water hole and look it over and say, no, I'm not drinking that. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm telling you that shepherd, before you ever put your foot there, yes. he already put his face there. He not taste of that water. Amen. You as a sheep and I as a sheep have got to learn to trust the shepherd. Yes. He's leading us. Amen. You don't ever get off on your own. You so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over here to these rocks. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You're going to wind up getting off over there and get wolf ate if you ain't careful. You're going to wind up getting out there and get lime ate if you ain't careful. You stay where the shepherd's at. When the shepherd sits down and says, right here's so where we're going to rest for the night. Don't you say, no, I'm not going to rest here. I don't want to sit here with you. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm telling you, you lean on the shepherd. Thank you know why? You know why he said the rod and the staff comfort him? I keep preaching the whole 23rd Psalm. I read this, you didn't get that one deal this morning, but I feel like I need to mention this too before I quit. He said the rod and the staff, they comfort. You know why? Because that rod and that staff, they also chasten. The shepherd uses that staff sometime. If that sheep won't stay out of poison weeds, if that little lamb won't get from going down to an alkali water hole and drinking it, if he won't quit venturing over to the lair of the wolf, amen, that shepherd will take that staff and he'll break the sheep's leg. And that way, everywhere I go, I've got to carry the sheep. He becomes entirely and utterly dependent upon the shepherd. If he gets in a bog, the shepherd shepherd uses the hook on the staff and he pulls him out of the bog. He uses the rod to beat the head of the predator. Amen. I'm telling you, church, Love you, God. you can trust your shepherd. Oh. You can lean on your shepherd. He knows way more than you do. Amen. He knows what water to drink. And he knows what pasture to feed in. Amen. Trust the shepherd. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If the shepherd stops and tells the sheep to feed. And there's a wolf on that rock, a bear on that rock, a mountain lion on that rock, a whole pack of coyotes on this rock, and the shepherd sits down and says, eat. Don't you stand there and second guess that shepherd. You bury your nose in the grass and you lead the wolf to the shepherd. Ah! bear to the shepherd. Amen. God didn't call a sheep Amen. to fight the wolf. God didn't call a sheep to fight a bear. You leave that to the shepherd. Amen. The shepherd can care for the sheep. Yes. Why? Because he was made our lamb of sacrifice. Our shepherd, Brother Junior Allen, has also been a sheep. Hallelujah.
He's going to lead you up. And when it comes time, he'll lead you back down. You listen this morning. I'm telling you, a shepherd knows when it's time for the sheep to go down. And he knows when it's time for the sheep to go up. It is the Lord. He said, if you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he, the Lord, will exalt you in due season. Amen. Brother Hamas Crawford said, and later heard of one this preacher named T.F. Tenney say, if you insist on doing God's job and exalting yourself, he'll be content to do your job and he'll humble you. Amen. But if you'll do your job and stay humble, God will worry about the exaltation in due time. When He leads you up the mountain, go up behind Him. When He leads you down to the valley, go behind Him. If He leads you down the valley of the shadow of death, as long as you're calling a shepherd, I'm telling you, it's going to be well with the sheep. If you trust the shepherd. Amen. You imagine what havoc would reign if a whole flock of sheep revolted against the shepherd and said, we'll decide where to eat. We'll decide where to water. We'll decide what we want to do. We'll pick our place to lay down. We'll prepare our table. I'm telling you, you're fixing to be a lamb chop for a bear. You're fixing to be a lamb chop for a lion. You're fixing to be nothing but a wad of fleece and a coyote spitting fleece out this way and sucking lamb chops in on this side. You better leave it to the shepherd. You better trust the shepherd. You say, Brother Justin, there's enemies. There's enemies on every side. I know they are. I know there's enemies everywhere I look. But he prepared the table. Right. Uh, 
If he sits at the table, you're all right. Yes. Trust me. Walk with him. Oh, there may be something in these rocks. The shepherd's walking ahead of you. You're all right. Don't walk beside him. Don't walk too far behind. Keep in step with the shepherd and follow him all the way. He'll lead you to green pasture. So, oh, you don't understand. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's all right. I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Amen. Jennifer had that dream about her dad. He had passed away. And maybe she's told about it. I can't remember if she did here. Probably had. Had that dream and, and said there was this big old hill of dirt, big mountain of dirt. Me and her had come up on that mountain. And she said I was throwing dirt at her, getting her dirty and pestering her, teasing her. Said here in a minute we looked and that, that, that mountain of dirt come her dad. Man, Brother Calvin. He'd come up the other side and she told how he looked and how strong he was. His hair wasn't white, his back wasn't bent, and a certain belt that he had on, and things she remembered. And Sister Gail said she saw him come and she said, Well, there you are. And he'd come up and give her a big hug. She said, Where have you been? What about this? What about that? And she said, Her dad looked at her and said, Yeah, you know, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And then he just walked off and left us there. And she said, I felt so alone. And then dad gave me a hug and said, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But she said, when I woke up, the Lord let me know. It's because he knew you knew the rest of that verse. It said, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I tell you, I'm not afraid to walk through a valley. If the shepherd's footsteps are what I'm walking in, I'm not afraid to climb a mountain. If I'm putting my feet in the shepherd's footsteps, I may not fill up his footstep like you do. I may not fill up his footstep like he does. But I follow the shepherd. Hey, stop. Many years ago, I'm done. I was walking from my house over to my dad's. Had to go down through some trees, cross a little branch, up a hill, break out in the pasture, go all over to dad's house. Ben was a little guy, probably, I don't know, two, three years old. We used to live in an old trailer house we had moved in over there. And uh, I got ready to go over to dad's that day, just going to walk. I'd walk sometimes and pray. And uh, back then, I just lay on my belly on the floor and pray. I used to walk and pray. I got too old and fat again. I was walking down through there and Ben said, I want to go with you. I said, all right, let's go. So we start down through there. And uh, it's kind of brushy, nasty place we was walking. We started going along. Ben's always getting off in the bushes and digging in stuff, pilfering through things. I said, I get over here. You'll get over and get on Copperhead. Ben looked at me. This little bitty guy. And uh, he looked at me and he said, I can do it. I can do it. I said, well, you just get over and do it, ten pal. He got off over the brush, fumbling around. I said, son, you're going to get off over and get on a snake. He's going to get you. He turned around and he said, I can do it. I said, all right. You just do it, bud. Amen. Yeah, I'll let him go. I'll let him wander off over that way. But see, I'm the shepherd. I'm the dad. I was watching him the whole time. I done looked ahead of him. I knew where he was fixing to go, and I was watching. If I saw something didn't look right, I'd have got him out of there. I let him go on down. We got down to that branch, and I started through this little bitty thing. It probably wasn't boot top high on me. I just took off across it, and I got a step across there. He waded off in it. He had little overalls on it, come way up on him. You know, it was deep on him. It wasn't very high at all on me. He hollered. He said, hey, Dad. I just reached over and caught him by the overhaul gallus and just picked him up and sent him across. It wasn't very big. But it's a Mississippi River to that little boy, you know. It's big to him. We go across that creek, across just a little open spot, and there's just a little old hump. Not really a hill, but just a hump. It's got rocks on it, probably the size of eggs or so, golf balls, and it's real loose. It's not packed. It never has been. I don't know why, just that way. We ride four wheelers up if you come up that hump and get some air and jump. I started up that little hump. I said, Ben, let me hold your hand, son. He said, I can do it. I said, okay. I started up that little rise and Ben's right behind me. His feet spun out from under me and he went down face first. He skinned his little britches legs and scuffed his hands up, you know. He was crying, dirt on his face, tears rolling. He turned around and he said, hey, Dad, he is when he's face little, he'd say, Hold you me. Hold you me. Come running up, hold you me, hold you me. I turned around there and looked at him. He said, Dad, hold you me. He's crying. So I reached down and he stuck his hand up. And I just kind of let him hold my hand. Of course, his hand wasn't nearly as big as mine. He got a hold of it. He's just going to hold my hand. I started on. And 
his little grip slipped and he fell again. And now remember, we done come a couple hundred yards through there. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And here we are now, all of a sudden, hold you me. And do you know where y'all ain't ever been there, have you? Huh? And the Lord said, get back over here. You're going to get on a snake. And I can do it. Get back over here. You're going to get drowned in that. I can do it. And then when we start to fall down, it's oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. That's how it, ain't it? I got a hold of him. He's, his little hand has slipped out of mine. And he looked up at me so sincere, little tears running. He's all scuffed up and dirty. And he said, Daddy, you have to hold my hand. I take hold of yours. I'm too little. And I got a hold of that little bitty hand, Sister Gail, and just one pull. I just picked him up, set him right up on top of that hump. He didn't even have to walk up. I just set him up there. I want to tell you something this morning. As we're going along the path of life, following the shepherd, and he's preparing these tables before us and all the time, I can do it. I can do it. And next thing you know, you're flat on your face. It's hold you me. Hold you me. You ever feel like you lose your grip on God? And you have to tell him, you have to hold my hand. I'm too little to hold yours. I can't hold your hand. God's hand's big enough that it spanned the rivers and hung the stars on nothing. My hand ain't big enough to get a hold of that. But brother, I'm telling you, he's got a hold of mine this morning. He's got a hold of yours. And if you'll just not be struck dumb with fear like a sheep is, if you'll just holler out and say, hold you me, God just pick you up and set you up on top of that hump and you'll go right on. By the time we got to Papa and Grammy's house, the tears were dried. He wasn't bleeding. He wasn't hurt. Now he turned them on when we got inside, of course, to tell it all to Grammy that her work on him. You know, he turned them tears right back off. It's amazing how that works, ain't it? But I'm telling you this morning, you can make it if you'll just trust the shepherd. Don't worry about your dining dinner, your arrangements. Don't worry about your dinner date. You just make sure the shepherd's the one that set the table. You're going to be all right. Praise God. Let's stand this morning. Just days ago, Ben is obviously as big as me now, and his hand's as big as mine. But just a few days ago, Brother Junior on the phone, it didn't come out, hold you me, but it sure was not to do it. It was with a broken voice. It was, Dad, I need you. I said, I'm on my way. I'll be there first thing in the morning. It's late tonight. You go to bed, you go to sleep, you trust the Lord. Mom and I will be there in the morning. You say, well, he's big. Why do you? Because sometimes you just can't do it by yourself. You hear me? That's why Sister Nancy's going to face something new when she tells Mom. You know what Mom does? She runs to church and tells the shepherd, hey, I need you to hold us over here. Can you help us over here? That's why we do it. We need to trust the shepherd. You may be in for a week of dining with the devil, but if the shepherd set the table, don't you worry about it. You'll be all right. Because it's not the last table he'll spread. He'll take me through this spot and he'll feed me again. Lord, I preached my best this morning. I delivered what I felt you gave me in prayer last night. Through the unction.